a super important uh, topic um, for patients, for doctors, uh, for us um, scientists, and uh, so we need you to um, help us. Um, and um, so I'm not looking forward to learning uh, what comes out of um, this workshop, and hopefully many more to uh, to come. <coughs> Um, so I, I think my, my um, uh, duty is now to explain to you what we really want to do uh, in, in lifetime. And so uh, I'll try to do this uh, without uh, assuming that you understand molecular uh, biology, um, but just assuming that you're really interested in trying to uh, understand what we are doing. Okay? So, um, Um, we have um, in in lifetime we have a vision about the medicine healthcare of the future, and uh, this is uh, how we think uh, progress can be made. So first of all, you know that uh, the way the current system works, uh, you you get some symptoms, um, pain blood in the urine, stuff like this, you go to the doctor and uh, then um, if you're lucky, nothing much happens. You, you get a pill, <coughs> you feel better, uh, but uh, uh, regrettably, and uh, the older we get and um, the population grows older, uh, we get a uh, diagnosis of uh, cancer, for example. Uh, and then uh, very often this comes uh, really with um, uh, a lot of um, uh, suffering uh, because um, the disease is already there. You already have the symptoms. Uh, and uh, the cells in your body at this point are uh, quite removed from healthy. Okay? So they're, they're really, if you will, aliens. Uh, and uh, there's really no way to, to push the cells back to healthy. This, this is very difficult to do, almost impossible. Uh, and so what you're, the, very often the only thing the doctors can really do is kill the cells, remove them, remove the tissue, uh, or uh, radiate you or, and your cells so that the proliferating cells die. Um, and uh, other uh, pretty invasive um, well, therapies. So um, this is of course uh, uh, also um, uh, terrible for the patient uh, very often. Um, uh, very often you cannot really uh, do therapy if you have Alzheimer. There's absolutely nothing uh, you can do. And this is of course also very expensive um, um, also for the society because there are families involved and so on. I don't probably need to explain this to you. But uh, what I need to explain to you is that we think that we uh, can bring in and integrate and apply really revolutionary new technologies that have uh, arisen in the last years. To a much earlier be able to detect when cells deviate from healthy. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the key technologies uh, that is now available is that we can, in essence, look into individual cells uh, and count or observe the molecules which are at work uh, in the cells. This was uh, not really possible uh, before, only for an you know, example here or there, but we can now do this in parallel for millions of cells. So um, by this and uh, other uh, methods, uh, we think we, can, uh, we will be able to detect, uh, as I said much earlier, uh, when cells deviate from healthy. And then, uh, I think it's, it's also clear that we have a, a much higher chance uh, to make these cells healthy again because they're not that far uh, away from, from healthy. And moreover, if we understand the molecular mechanisms or the reasons why the cells become uh, um, diseased, we can targets that we can try to operate on molecularly or, or with uh, the drugs to push these cells back to healthy. So the, the word for this is interception. And so it's, uh, it's a word that is between, let's say, therapy uh, and uh, prevention. It's uh, to uh, just uh, correct uh, something that has uh, gone wrong. 
And so the idea is that in the future, there would be much more of monitoring uh, uh, humans and detecting uh, small uh, deviations early on and then uh, um, uh, intercepting that, rather than waiting until it is too late. Because we think that uh, um, a lot of the cells uh, in cancer are, again, so removed <coughs> from, uh, from healthy that even if you understand some of the mechanisms uh, um, that take part, it will be extremely difficult and we have done 50 years of cancer, 60 years of cancer research or more, uh, to, to really um, uh, put this understanding into uh, um, uh, making these cells healthy because the operations are so complex. Okay, now um, this is uh, the uh, European uh, attempt uh, to push this vision into reality. So what has happened uh, during the past uh, two years is that about 90 research institutes have come together uh, to um, uh, push for uh, making this vision reality. Uh, there are also companies involved because obviously in um, uh, this kind of vision uh, we will apply completely new methods to looking and studying diseases. And it is clear that then you get a lot of innovation. It's just you don't need to be really genius uh, to see that. Um, what is maybe interesting here to point out is that they're not only classic big uh, pharma companies like Roche or uh, Bayer or Novartis uh, and so on. There are also uh, some uh, data uh, companies uh, here. And uh, the reason for this is uh, the following. Um, I said that uh, we, if we monitor cells, uh, we can now much better cells that are becoming sick. But if you think about it, it means that you have to look at many, many, many cells, right? Huge numbers of uh, cells. And so uh, you need to look at them molecularly, so you, you need to uh, be able to um, learn what kind of molecules are working in which way in each individual cell. We have 20,000 genes in our body, uh, so 20,000 genes interact somehow, so this is happening in every cell. And so if you do this for millions of cells, or billions of cells, you're generating data that are so enormous uh, that you need um, a lot of compute and data sciences uh, to, to even handle the data. But the problem was going to go much further, or the opportunity. We think that because we are collecting the data that are molecularly uh, important to understand for understanding how cells make decisions, okay, or why cells get sick, or how the cells will react uh, to a drug, that we think that we can um, launch machine learning uh, that's exactly a machine learning problem, right? So, um, to predict uh, uh, how cells will react to certain drugs or, or what would happen if you don't treat and uh, so on. So, there's clearly a very important component in uh, machine learning uh, together with generating the data by the single cell methods I, I um, alluded to. And then, of course, if you want to understand the mechanisms or if you want to run drug screens and so on, you need models. Uh, um, you, you, you can realistically try um, to work with. And um, there are lots of mouse models, other animal models around, and they are also will be part of the research, of course. But we believe that it's, uh, the time has come to massively push uh, human organoids which is the ability that has uh, arisen in, in past years to grow in the lab in vitro uh, small uh, organs um, derived from uh, patient cells. So the way this works is you take, let's say, a few skin cells, you reprogram these skin cells into a totally potent stem cell, then you drive these stem cells to uh, generate in three dimensions a small liver, a small kidney, a small brain. And so these models are, of course, individual for each person, so they reflect your genetic uh, background. And so uh, you can uh, try then to actually uh, produce uh, drugs which are really uh, tailored uh, for your problem, for the interception tailored to you. <coughs> so this is what we bring to, uh, want to bring uh, uh, together. Now, um, 
I want to explain to you a little bit really how this uh, works. And uh, I'll take uh, 10 minutes uh, for this. Um, so just some stuff that is re really ongoing in labs, uh, what we can do right now. Uh, so it, it, I'm hoping that we have some fun uh, in, in, uh, in following this. <coughs> so last year in science, uh, there was a, a people voted for the breakthrough of the year. And uh, this was a winner. And uh, we were very happy because uh, um, from my institute, uh, there were several papers uh, featured in this, so we are a little bit proud of this. But it's, uh, this is a, a big community, so there are also, uh, of course, many other labs who, who made very important uh, contributions uh, to this. But in essence, it, it, it boils down to this. If, if you, uh, uh, um, th this is here a stem cell, okay? So each dot is a particular cell. And what you see now is how a stem cell marches uh, through different uh, uh, cellular states uh, in becoming, let's say, a kidney cell, okay? Or the stem cell becomes here a neuronal cell. And so the breakthrough is that we actually know in each point of this trajectory the molecular, full molecular state of these cells. So it's not that we just, you know, say, okay, the stem cell becomes a new one, we actually understand now, or we know the molecular states, all the changes that happened in these cells from stem cell to becoming a new one. So I think that is a really a pretty uh, amazing because we can now study these changes, right? Small changes, um, not just the big ones, which are very difficult to understand. And so I think this is a little bit like uh, back in the um, 17th or 18th century when people looked at the trajectories of planets and uh, when you look at the differential like Newton did, uh, then you are actually able to uh, understand these changes because you are able uh, to um, uh, come up with cause and consequence. Okay? So you can talk about forces that cause something and this would probably not really apply to cells, but uh, I still think that looking at these differentials is something totally novel, uh, and we can compare these differentials between all kinds of different biological and clinical situations, so this will be an enormously rich data situation. So um, I want to give an example. This is a famous embryo, it's a fly embryo, um, and it will develop into a fly that, that we all know. And uh, um, some decades ago, Ms. Van Folhart in France uh, got the Nobel Prize when they discovered that genes uh, in this embryo are patterns and that these patterns uh, describe uh, the, the body plan of the developing fly. So this is, these are patterns which eventually become, let's say, the, the head or, or the thorax, uh, parts of the uh, patterned body plan. And so the colors here are that, that uh, stainings for these different genes, okay? And you see how beautiful that is, and probably also how complex that is, because we're only looking at two genes, uh, but their fly has 10,000. Now, what we have been doing a couple of years ago is uh, reconstructing the embryo into what we call the virtual fly. So it lives on our computer. And so we know now in each cell the um, expression of each gene. So we can actually um, uh, replace uh, these very laborious uh, biochemical methods to look at genes in space by simply asking the computer where is gene X, where is gene Y, and so on. They can look at the um, interactions of genes like this. Now, uh, I want to say that we have improved this and we have, we have new ways of doing this also in human uh, tissues, and I just want to tell you the idea because it's kind of fun. So if you imagine you have uh, sequenced, uh, so you, you, you have single cells and in each cell you know the molecular state indicated by, by these colors here, each color for a different gene. So you, you see, you take an organ, to do this technology right now, you have to dissociate the organ to single cells and then you analyze each cell. And so you get really this group of um, uh, patterns and now if you do the simplest possible thing, which is to, um, first of all, you reduce it to one gene, so you make, you make it black and white, so it's only reconstruct how one gene is expressed in the tissue. 
if you do the simplest possible thing, you just put the cells at random into some configuration, and you look now at this gene, you will see that this cannot be really, that this cannot be true, right? This doesn't make any sense. This is not uh, how um, pictures look like. And so you can start to shuffle themselves around, right, hoping that you will discover the right picture. And if by chance you hit the right configuration, you will know right away that this is actually uh, the true solution. This is how the cells must be arranged. If actually you look at more than one gene, this becomes easier to do because you have more constraints. And so this uh, can be even easier, uh, more easily reconstructed. Now, the problem is if you have a thousand cells, you have already more combinations of putting them uh, in configurations than stars in the universe. And so it is not possible to go through all these configurations and decide uh, how, um, how it looks like. But we have been able to overcome this actually in a collaboration with Nia Friedman. Uh, and I'm not going to go into this, but uh, more Nitsan collaboration with a uh, postdoc in my lab, ECOS, realized that uh, this can be mapped uh, or rewritten as an uh, optimal transport theory problem and uh, for, for which uh, there are um, ways to solve. The point here is that this is uh, very will be happening all the time. We need to find data science solutions uh, to our problems. Okay. And so you really have to integrate things. You, it, it, the times where you can do biochemistry and you know, hope to cure some disease, I think, are pretty much over. You have to work together with uh, computational people from all kinds of different backgrounds. You have to uh, kind of work together with engineers and so on. And so this is what we try to do also in lifetime, to bring these disciplines together, to create places where they really interact, and then really novel insights come. Now, this can be put to use, so uh, we can also hunt now for genes which are important for space and for the fly and which is just what we can now do on the computer, actually. Okay? We can go through all the genes and select the ones which are interesting. And we can use also for the mouse brain, so this is a slice through the mouse brain, and we can now discover genes which are important for organizing uh, tissues. You may, these are, of course, also in some sense drug targets uh, if you see that they're perturbed in, 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 in diseases. Now, I just want to make the point that um, I think there's a lifetime, so we are pushing these kinds of approaches as one thing that's going on, and actually this is, I think, transforming how we do histology and pathology. Because what is still going on when you go here to the hospital is that, that uh, people take a sample and then it's given to the histologist or the pathologist and they do this. They, they, they take an antibody or some other markers or stains and look for the uh, adventitia tissue like this. Okay? And there, there are really not that many that are being used to, to somehow then classify your disease and make a diagnosis. So what we think we can do, we can really put this into full molecular mode. So we can actually look at all genes at each point in the tissue and uh, take this as a basis uh, for the diagnosis. So we think we can really uh, um, discover, besides getting much better diagnosis and so on, uh, we can discover new biomarkers and drug targets which are in space. <coughs> so this is actually the first prototype uh, that in my lab, um, our approach. So you can put slices on these things and then we uh, molecularly describe at each point in the tissue uh, the molecular states, and then we arrange this in three dimensions to, to reconstruct the, the uh, uh, full tissue. And I want to, do we have a few minutes left? I didn't look at the... Yeah. Uh, okay. I want to describe the third pillar of lifetime uh, to you, uh, which is organoids, and I just want to present to you where we are, and it's also for ethical, I think, uh, uh, considerations very important. So, uh, in my lab, we grow mini brains, human mini brains, all organoids. And so, we use protocols developed by others in Europe. This is actually something that was developed in Europe, a um, very European topic. Uh, and this uh, little brain that's 90 days old from a healthy human. So, a few skin cells, we do some molecular 
uh, um, manipulations, and then you grow these stem cells that you derive into this brain. Keeps, you can keep it uh, in, in your lab alive, uh, and we stained it here for neurons and astrocytes, which are very important cells in our brain, obviously, and you can see that there's some complex uh, tissue there. But actually, these tissues are fire, so the neurons are active, there are synapses, uh, there, there's um, really the new electrophysiology of these things, so this is some sense in the live brain. Doesn't have any input from the outside world, so I don't have a problem to kind of do stuff with it, but it is a live brain. Now, when we uh, unleash our methods like single cell analysis, and so each dot here is the molecular makeup of a cell, and so we mathematically then cluster them so that similar cells are together. Uh, we can look at which molecules are active, and then we, we see what kind of cells are there. So uh, there are astroglia, there, there are um, glioblastoma-related cells and other things. So it's actually, if you compare this to a normal uh, young fetal human brain, this is exactly what you should get. So at the, on this level, uh, the uh, human organoids actually uh, recapitulate the human brain. Now, this is, uh, you can, uh, of course, go, grow an organoid from a person who has a problem. This is a terrible disease, a rare disease. And uh, so you can grow organoids uh, from a patient with this disease. And now you can do something really beautiful and very important for science. Because if you grow this, what, to what do you compare? Right? You can say, okay, you take a healthy one, but what really is healthy? So humans are very different, and so if you have complex diseases, there are probably many contributions in many genes. And so it is very difficult to, uh, to control this experiment if the genetic background is different, right? So if I have a problem, it's kind of not, not trivial to compare to uh, your brain if it's healthy. So what we do here is we use CRISPR-Cas, which probably everybody knows what it is, uh, to actually correct the gene. We know which gene has a problem uh, in this patient. So we can correct this gene in, in our lab, and we can grow a mini brain that is now, we call that, corrected. So it, it is the brain that the patient would have if he wouldn't have this problem. And so now we can compare, we molecularly find out what is wrong, what are the uh, things that we could maybe interfere in the future to help this patient. And this is just to, to show you that it's really amazing how this works. If you look at spike rates uh, in between these, as, a, as a readout of phenotype, you can actually see that uh, the spike rates uh, in, the, in the patient uh, are lower compared uh, to the um, uh, corrected one, uh, which is uh, almost as, uh, as normal. So there's a, there's a clear effect on the physiology uh, caused by, by this mutation. We also go hunting uh, patients, um, and uh, also uh, hunting patients, uh, we can correct, uh, we know the genetic course, so we can grow healthy brains uh, from these patients. And you can, uh, actually I think this is a swap in the, in the labels, uh, yeah, so th this is uh, swapped. I apologize for this. I was doing everything. So this is actually the corrected one, and, and this is uh, the uh, a disease phenotype. And you can see that you get even early on in development a clear phenotype, which tells you that maybe some also diseases that are traditionally thought as, as uh, late diseases uh, can be studied also in the developing system or maybe even developmental uh, diseases. Now, um, I, I'll stop here, so this is my, my last slide. I think I, we have gone through the three pillars with some examples, okay? And now, I think there are, in, for the future, really profound uh, ethical problems, and I'm ju I just listed three, but uh, many more uh, that need to be addressed, discussed, and um, uh, published. So GDPR is obvious, uh, then we need to select diseases somehow, which we want to, uh, we want to put particular focus on. Uh, and we are growing, as I said, organoids, and I think this is totally normal. And uh, if you imagine that in 10 years, probably these organoids will be much more realistic. 
this is something to talk about. What is GDPR? Sorry. Oh, uh, that's uh, the uh, the data uh, protection rights of patients oh, okay. uh, that uh, that have been the EU directive. Yes. Yeah. So I want to. Uh, sorry, I, I forgot this. So, so the li lifetime status quo, so this is important. Where are we actually? So after two rounds and two evaluation, sorry, after two evaluation rounds, um, we were selected by the European Commission and received 1 million euro uh, to build a roadmap <coughs> for Europe. Okay. Um, the, the flagship program has been uh, uh, cancelled, uh, although uh, we were given the award to, to write the roadmap. But, um, and this has complicated political reasons, uh, but um, uh, we know from uh, many discussions uh, with the European Commission, and just actually last week uh, from a very important one, we know that the European Commission is committed uh, to morph lifetime into new funding schemes, okay? So while we develop the roadmap, they're working on uh, finding the best uh, means to support us. They really want lifetime to succeed. Uh, and they have already identified uh, sources for which they can pay uh, fund infrastructure uh, for lifetime and research. 